as um, part of our commitment to invite um, guest speakers to uh, the Curators Hub, um, bringing in and recognizing um, the, the forms of knowledge that in many ways enable our work, um, enable us also uh, a certain, um, apprehensively so using the word, uh, cultural freedom uh, within uh, our current climate. Karuna Nandi is a one such leading figure whose work, uh, by being in conversation, we also wish to acknowledge, to, to recognize and give gratitude for. She is an advocate at the Supreme Court of India, an international human rights lawyer whose valued uh, sense of public engagement, ethics, and expert counsel um, is is um, extremely vital um, to not only our political uh, realities, but our cultural realities that are webbed and connected. And so in the kinds of cases that she has argued for, that she has won um, after immense effort, after many years at times, uh, through the work of other colleagues uh, working alongside her, this is the enduring work that we wish to recognize today. Her pro, pro bono practice includes the um, Supreme Court litigation from the 1984 uh, gas disaster and toxic waste dumps in Bhopal. She has also argued cases involving the rights of independent media, alleged terrorists, mentally ill people, and class actions on sexual harassment. Karana's advisory and policy work um, includes various contributions um, at times with uh, various government bodies, including in Nepal, Pakistan, and Bhutan. Uh, also working um, in uh, prestigious and international forums, um, working on freedom of expression, working uh, on um, the Anti-Rape Laws and Rights to Food Act. She has been interviewed and commented on free speech, gender, and legal issues in various media and has also been acknowledged as the Time 100 Most Influential Voices of 2022. Welcome, Karuna. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Natasha. I am delighted to be in conversation with, um, with you and with, you know, with artists and with, uh, because as we were speaking, we were speaking of this earlier, and I've represented different kinds of artists, depending on how you define art, I suppose. Um, and I also have a lot of close friends who are artists. And I think that this working in silos is an artificial creation of intellectualism in, you know, it's much more of a trend in this century. And I'm so glad that in our small ways, we're changing that now. So. Um, the way that Natasha and I and Priyanka and Pratik have designed this is to be something that is, um, in, you know, very much in conversation with all of you. So, no, no thought, no question is too trivial, and um, we hope to explore the synergies and have, uh, you know, fun. Thank you. Um, to start with, and we've been speaking today uh, as well about um, the kinds of um, modes, as you said, yes, there's the artificial silos that sort of um, apparently separate us, but the minute uh, one runs into a legal problem, then suddenly that, that's, that artificial separation is, is no more. And um, so this conversation, in a sense, is also perhaps a way of bringing us uh, closer into, uh, Karna, what we were thinking of as sort of the performance of speech making and speech acts, um, given that artistic intelligence is so concerned with in a sense, imagining new modes of language, um, thinking about emancipatory forms and frameworks of language, um, but also building um, entries of testimony um, that may not be permissible in a courtroom. These are, these are some of the different 
kinds of things that are you know also being addressed today um, by practitioners uh, who also come from come from very diverse backgrounds and whose histories have been systemically erased and neglected so how how may we sort of bring bring together sort of this this somewhat daunting framework of legal speech with sort of a sense of 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 the speculative and imaginative in artistic modes of speech production uh, i think there's two different flows there's two different ways to look at it right like one is how to bring the legal into into the art because a lot of the suppression that we see today in all speech of art um, is through the law so it's not that you know it's not like the first emergency right it's uh, of 1976 it's not that there's an official suspension of fundamental rights it's that it's much worse because at least when the when fundamental rights were restored there was a whole bunch of case law that was restored it was you know it just all came back right whereas now what's happening um i mean it was also much more violent and there were i'm not saying that indira gandhi's emergency was um was all better than than now but what i'm saying is that there's a way in which legally speaking what's happening now is a lot more damaging because there are changes that are happening to the law that are going to last into new governments and they're going to last for a long time there are judicial appointments that are happening that are motivated by government there are a uh, massive changes in how policing happens and how um the kind of impunity that we see over certain speech acts and the protection of other speech acts for example right and we're also seeing we're also seeing the change in actual law so the indian penal code and the criminal procedure code is going to be overhauled quite soon and it's going to be laid before parliament and before you know it we're going to have laws that are even more draconian than we have now and the reason that we have laws in the, the criminal laws draconian now is because much of it is wasted because they want a democratic government they weren't interested in hearing from the polity and then being reconstituted as um those as governors or as those who govern as government rather right so that governance was easier for them right now not only Really has that I contributed to a culture that we already have. We don't have a very strong free speech culture in this country. I think one of the benefits of it being suppressed um, is that it's burgeoning a little bit. So um, my friend Usma did a, um, a, I mean acquaintance did a made a sort of. piece of art a multimedia piece where she interviewed me about um you know free speech actually and then she used those words in her installation so i think there are flows to be had both ways the work that you were talking about uh the artists that you represent you know a sonic scape and um of a person that, that a person in jail experiences i think that's very interesting for example i would love to be able to use when arguing for example against solitary confinement i would love to be able to bring that kind of visceral experience into a courtroom we are we're far away from that let's be clear you know um our courtrooms are fairly conservative but we're always 
my attempt always in court is to bring the experience closer home for it not to be overly abstract and polysyllabic and but for the court to really attempt to put themselves in the shoes of the litigant right whether it so we have the big marital rape appeal coming up in february we have the bopal curative petition coming up in january and these are huge challenges because these are people who are very very different from our judges our judges are in the supreme court are you know in their mid 60s they're almost exclusively i mean there there's a big effort to increase representation um under the this present chief justice and the new chief justice and also also actually um, justice ramana and there are more women but there are very very few women right there are uh, i mean it's but it's mostly upper caste able bodied cis het you name it um privileged hindu men now these people therefore are very different from the a lot of the litigants that come before them i'm not saying the representation like you know we've seen with suella braverman in particular as well as rishi sunak that a representation isn't always the answer you know but i think representation is definitely part of the answer um yeah i'd like to come to um that particular speech i'm talking about um you know women in court and their advocacy work um in your speech uh for at uh, for time 100 when receiving this uh, acknowledgement you mention patriarchy is coming back like a cancer and metastasizing in court judgments and so this this sort of way in which um you are part of um uh, unfortunately a small lur a legacy a fraction um but of women representatives who have been uh, shaping the legal paradigm um of of our country and and also the kind of colonial burdens of that of that legal paradigm um and i also um was listening to uh, an interview that you did with fali nariman where you bring up the representation of women in the bench and at the highest levels um and and he had something very different to say and you were advocating for something that was also like a structural readjustment really um while being someone who also works actively uh, on gender justice so i love to kind of hear a bit more about that um you know your source of inspiration and your your struggles with with the system in that sense ah uh, that's that's a that's a bunch of big questions You know, I think being a lawyer is hard, and being an artist is hard, right? Being a woman is often hard. Now, when we are engaging in being people who are attempting to do work. with particular labels and boxes thrust upon us there's the challenge is manifold how we relate relate to the particular particularities of the patriarchies the the hetero patriarchy that we inhabit um is quite contextual when i started um and i think we all navigate them in different ways and i think this is why when people say to me that oh uh, the hijab should be banned or that um i or speak of other bans or say you know or take a very hard line position for example against karwa chauth you know i think it's fundamental to understand that the range of options available to um the range of options available to 
not just women, but women, queer people, Dalit folk, um, disabled people, the range of options available are more limited, you know. And by banning something, you're taking away another option in a society that doesn't have either the will or the um, ability to expand that range. So, more concretely, when I entered the law, I was, I think, looking to acquire healthy power, right? And relate to the patriarchy and play with the patriarchal structures in those ways and with a sense of integrity intact, right? But what that meant, I think, as a result was that to some extent I was playing with the, I was playing by the rules of the old boys, actually. And at some point, I just thought, I think I, 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 it came to a point where I felt enough's enough. And I just started to be myself, you know. Um, also a lot more in court. So I would smile, I would make jokes, I would, uh, you know, more so, right? Like rather than trying to be serious all the time and trying to, you know, be all. Um, and, and I find that it serves me a lot better, but it's also polarizing. So, so there are people who, so there's, you know, so I get a lot of love and I'm so grateful for it because that's, that's, you know, a big part of what keeps you going, right? But I also get, um, but I also get my own fair share of, uh, uh, I mean, I don't want to say hate because it's horrible to think of yourself in the world like that, but I also get hate, you know? I've blocked most of my haters on Twitter and I'm very happy to say. So, so and anyway, you know, content moderation is terrible on Twitter in India. So I don't think we're going to see, see a change with Elon Musk's um, uh, takeover. But, but I think that making space, you know, once we, you know, show up as ourselves, the more we show up as ourselves and the more we do the work as ourselves, even if we don't, and I think, no, I'm going to, I'm going to edit that. And creating space, not just for ourselves, right? But space for others, which also actually now in our generation, there's a much greater realization that if there are, you know, three, two women on a panel or three women on a panel, you know, it's much more likely that um, the conversation will go in a, in a particular way rather than just that one token woman, you know? And that it's only, you know, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg says, that she wanted to wait until there were nine women on the Supreme Court. I've been a hundred percent women Supreme Court. So, um, I think occupying space is significant. Listening to ourselves and honoring um, the identities that we have and claim, and honoring the identities of others that aren't the sort of little sliver that usually gets honored is, you know, lets us all breathe out a little bit. There's a sigh of relief. There's a space that gets created. And what else is life about? Um, on, on the note of um, uh, Rishi Sunak, I kind of just have to bring that up now that I'm, I'm back. It was like horrible to sort of like take in that news from Berlin and, you know, yeah, sense, sense the, the accolades without criticality. I understand, you know, what you say as well about um, representation in a certain sense and, and, and what that means in these offices. Um, but the paradoxical toxicity of conservative plutocrats coming to power um, in the UK and, and elsewhere in the through the diaspora that, that holds a certain amount of um, affluence and then and sort of works for the affluent 
um, yeah. in those contexts, um, importantly. And, and advocating even for the most threatening architectures for asylum seekers, um, for, okay. for, for those who have not had the, the privilege of easy entry, but also not of sustenance um, within yeah. these, um, within these um, cities that are unaffordable. Um, to then celebrate them simplistically for their ethnicity um, is something that we inherently, it feels we need to really question question that fundamentally so and and you you've sort of come come out with your opinion on that and 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 yet, and then yet I just sort of yeah I wonder again um, in a social sense but then also in a legal sense you know what what does it mean um, when a head of state is sort of speaking in in these ways and then sort of holds a certain identity what what are the the troubling aspects of that that we might see coming forward So one of the big things of our time is the polarization of polities all over the world, right? There's the rise of sovereignty. There's the uh, reduction of international solidarity. And there is huge polarization within uh, communities, within countries. I think a significant part of that is because of the way platforms uh, have been working, you know, um, and there are two things that go viral, inspiration and hate. Now, both are partisan, right? Both suffer from a strong uh, confirmation bias. And so all over the world, we have people who now have very strong feelings and everyone has an opinion. Um, Fact is at a premium because it's now become more and more difficult to be a journalist who gets paid with a structure of editors that get paid. I mean, with The Wire, for example, right? The Wire has some of the best editors in the world, but they're hugely underfunded. And if you want to do tech stories well, like you need to be properly funded and you need to have proper tech editors and you need to have particular structures in place, right? Um, and I mean, I just want to say, because I think there's an unnecessary debate there, that they have done some of the most important and hard-hitting investigative stories that we have had so far. So when I see a sort of holier-than-thou attitude when people are, you know, when people say that, oh, uh, they had it coming to them and oh, that was sloppy journalism, frankly, you know, like do the work they did and then let's talk, right? Instead of sitting various stories out. And, um, but that's in its own place. So... So in this fairly polarized world, right? And I think that's something that has to be addressed fundamentally, like when we look at democracies, um, and it's not. But in this polarized world, when we have somebody who is a person of color at one end, and, that, and if that end is an end that stands for, stands against climate change, think of how bizarre that is you know, and how important that is, because it's very much against countries like India. We have a massive coastline, you know. We will, we are already suffering, we will suffer, we will suffer with deaths, we will suffer with droughts, we will suffer with the kinds of damage that um, Sunak has no interest in addressing. He kicked out of his cabinet the uh, climate uh, secretary, right? Um, and of course, the asylum seekers and uh, others. I think uh, sort of what, what brings all of this into much sharper relief is actually Suella Braverman, or as, as my sister-in-law calls her, Suella Deville. Um, <laughs> I didn't say that. And, you know, I think when, if Suella Braverman says something, she's much more likely to get away with it than a white male politician, right? And to perpetuate and further the kind of racist, anti-asylum, xenophobic policy. You know, it's very useful to have something like that, somebody like that, right? Um, at the same time, and you know, we were talking about this earlier, I think that because of the polarization in the world, we have a significantly reduced capacity to hold paradox. 
you know and and so this side taking needs to stop because frequently the ro- the world isn't entirely consistent you know and rishi sunak and even you know suella uh, brevman will make it easier i think for a progressive person of color to become prime minister so it's all contextual it's all trade offs um sometimes more than others life is imperfect life is complicated and unpacking these issues is and and reaching understandings i think is uh, and while while we're doing that i think it's much more important than taking sides you know and uh, i think i am i've blocked all my uh, horrible trolls but i'm going to make more of an effort now after i spoke to um follow more credible uh, well, you know follow more right wing handles that aren't aren't trolls but i want to address the, you know i didn't entirely properly address the question that you had asked earlier natasha inspiration art joy these are very important acts of resistance these are very fundamental acts of living and when it's hard if you have a court case that's taking years one of the hardest court cases in the world right like the challenging the biggest corporate governmental nexus in the united states the for example the um obama government and the um his assistant secretary of state wrote a letter to montek singh alwalia here um when the planning commission was looking for a loan from the world bank and said can you get rid of this dow problem right and these are the so called good guys so the bjp or the you know of course the congress is um problems and the the corruption with regard to bhopal is legendary but even the bjp government they responded with eight pages in terms of rejoinder to a reply that was so big then you also come across in court and in other places people saying oh god is that still going on and i wish i was doing something more you know um so there is all of that when all of that is against one then finding the core of why how to make that work is important so i didn't want to just get lost in the papers so when this this round of the litigation began i went down to bhopal and um spent a couple of days there meeting people again and talking to people and um yes giving speeches in large you know fora to survivors but also having individual conversations and coming back to the core of what i felt was important and who i felt who i was serving you know and the the sort of or actual nature of the case and attempted to bring that in the courtroom because whenever i'm in court like today i was in court for a, you know i was talking to pratik and it was kind of funny because i was in court for a company called narayan industries that was that had lost a tender the west bengal government right and but the thing is that what was that case about and what was uh, even if it's not a big human rights case with with a very obvious um emotional or uh, rights or you know lofty connection right like what he was supplying was icu machines for children and neonates and the forgeries then meant that these there were going to be worse machines you know and here was somebody who was an honest business person and was really upset about this and wanted to do something about this and so when i walk into court i always 
when I am a bit stressed or nervous or getting lost in my head, I take a deep breath and tell myself that this is not about me. That I am the channel through which my client and that this kind of, and this version of justice is meant to communicate itself. And that always, that always helps. Yeah, thank you for that. I think the, this notion as well um, of justice is something we've been sort of also um, holding in the room, right? Because um, it's not even simply about justice being delayed, it's just, um, it's also justice as a medium. That's, that's something that I've been sort of thinking through. Justice itself as, as a medium that, that may not also um, uh, arrive in, in, a, in, a, in a material sense uh, within one's lifetime. And that, that is precisely, like when I think about the, the case of Bhopal, it's, it's, it's something, yeah. you know, and many would sort of reflect perhaps with me, it's sort of something I feel like I've been hearing since, since I was like, since I was an infant. Yeah. And so you sort of grow yes. up with, with that, that, that sensory notion, no matter how far you are from it, of yeah. the, the the scales of of that that case of justice sort of not even being not even being able to um, for it not even being able to arrive in a um, in a material sense and and sort of it it keeps gaining magnitude and perhaps also threading itself with other other such sort of cases in which the magnitude um, is immense it's in the atmosphere uh, for us all. Um, I am going to open up to to questions from from our audience. Um, so, but you know, in that context, yeah. do open it up. But in that context, I wanted to quote Seamus Heaney because I was, I was once. You know, I've been I've been working at this for a long time, right? It's a huge amount of work. It's obviously entirely pro bono. It's um, and it doesn't have the kind of success that some of my gender work has had or some of my free speech work has had, right? Like, for example, you know, when we speak about staying with it and working hard and because doing what we have control over, right? Um, very, I mean, fre fairly frequently, we get that amazing judgment or that amazing legislation or, you know, th that, those amazing bits of the legislation, right? Like, so for example, when No Fathers in Kashmir came to me and I was told that uh, they were, you know, that there was a ban and they wanted a youth certificate, like for children, you know, and that was particularly important actually for, Indi for ch Indian children, children in, uh, you know, the mainland to be um, watching a film like that, right, and understanding what's really going on with the disappearances, etc. So, it seemed like a bit of a far-fetched idea. And we worked really hard at finding the right um, case law and it's and the right angle. And I was, uh, uh, you know, I was on personal and I came out for that, just for that, you know, and, and we won, we got a US certificate. And so, this case, and I, I'm sort of much more oriented personality-wise towards impact. I find it difficult. I find resistance and persistence much more. I mean, persistence I'm, I'm quite good at, but I find resistance difficult without those significant wins. We've had some wins, like, but it took, for example, years of incredibly hard work to even bring safe water to the people drinking the toxic waste. Because the government would keep coming back and saying, we've done it. And then we'd have to go back and say, well, actually, in this house, this house, this house, this house, this house, here's a list of, you know, 500 homes that are still drinking water laced with dichlorobenzene and hexachlorocyclohexane, you know? But then we got that in the end. We got a healthcare judgment. And then you have to work harder then to implement it because there's a huge problem with politics and government. And I was telling um, one of the activists that, Oh God, what's the point? 
and he said he said you know to keep justice alive to keep the to keep hope alive is fundamental to do the work so that as shamus heeny once wrote history says don't hope on this side of the grave but then once in a lifetime the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope in history rhyme thank you for that um if there are questions it would be great if you actually if you don't mind coming here so karna can see you people oh, if you're feeling lazy i'll just hear you yeah okay yeah uh you mentioned uh, rishi shunak i yeah. don't think any liberal person of color can ever come to power in one of these states in either the usa or uh, it's only because they are conservative that is why there is some chance of these people coming to power don't you think so a liberal person of color um coming to power would be a contradiction i think that's one thing and the other thing is about the legal system this legal system is built on privilege uh those Absolutely. who come it's it's uh, um even representatives of uh, say dalits or minorities when they are uh, judges somehow they become representatives of the establishment more than i mean there are people individually they may have their values but the laws are such the legal system is such that uh, they actually represent or are tilted in favor of privilege uh, don't don't you think that um so my answer to your first point is president obama and kamala harris <laughs> you know um i will also say though that there's a way in which power is more accessible to uh conservative power is but, but no no i think if you look at the rise of obama and kamala harris on the one hand and sunak on the other um i think it's important to acknowledge that the world is changing a little bit you know and how great is that um with regard to the legal system see look what law is supposed to do is to codify relationships between citizens between citizens and the state and between you know between how we speak what is beyond the pale what is not what art we can make what art we absolutely can't make and it's in theory meant to be a social contract that we all make as we live together and that we give up rights we give up certain rights so that we can live together with more rights right like that's the theory of it that's you know hobbes rousseau law natural rights that you come into the world basically variations on the theme this is um in significant part nonsense and the reason that this is nonsense is because you inherit the social contract you know um it's not that for example if you look at the law on surrogates and nobody asked the surrogates you know if you look at even the uh, supreme court case on hijab and there were very few like even on tv debates right like there were very few hijabis in court there was just not enough represent representation of um muslim women of different persuasions you know so even when you had progressive judgments you had progressive judgments in sabri mala even right uh you have progr- progressive judgments of the same cohort of judges that we were just speaking of but um their idea of what was progressive in the particular situation right so um 
so who makes law who gets asked when laws are made um who determines how that law is interpreted whose voices are in the courtroom that's something that i am uh, and many others are working very hard to change and it's a really it's a very seriously uphill task um because when reliance is in the courtroom i also do you know what uh, i also do commercial work when uh, when i am representing uh, i don't represent reliance but when i'm representing a big company or when reliance is in the courtroom the kind of time and space you're given is different you know and the reliance gas case went on for months frankly and we are told in the bhopal cases that no you're going to have a short time because these are some of the most disadvantaged people in the world right um so where does that leave us there there are people that say that law codifies power actually and i don't have that kind of deep cynical view of it because i wouldn't be doing it otherwise um i think i think coming closer to a social contract that's based on justice that's based on this glorious constitution that is still glorious uh it's going to change at some point unless we fight for it not to um but there's a lot to believe in and there's a lot we must always i think acknowledge progress we must always um we must always hold that dear questions comments we have the 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 lady behind you the person behind you natasha no also the yeah there you go hello um thank Hi. you for this conversation um i actually just have a comment uh and this is based on the project we were working on which was looking at discursive justice and the so it was looking at what justice discursive justice right yes um and what was incredible um to look through was of course those cases took forever and often um uh the judgments <laughs> they were not even uh, maybe they were, they were satisfying after 25 years of fighting uh there were some positive judgments but what um myself and my collaborators were actually looking at is or found interesting is how used those um moments to speak they used those moments to enter different um ways of speech different ways of dress they also um so on i think one of the cases was um i forget i think it was the british islands um and what this one chief was actually fighting about land that was being used for or wanted to be used for commercial um uh, uh possibilities and he was saying that they have custody of this land and he was using dress to prove that he was using uh, artifacts mm-hmm. to show their understanding of this particular land and to show the harmony that they were um uh or the 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 harmony the the way that they had been taking custody of this land and so in that moment um they were able also because this was a a british law to take a different language not to only rely on the british language and the british way of understanding but to use their own uh speech and to enter that into history so we were also thinking or we found that it was interesting to like think about court as a way of entering speech and reports so for us to see those moments um in 2020 or something that was happening in 1817 right i mean so of course said that this is um beautiful to find and we are still needing these kind of moments but like to see that to receive that message somewhat 200 years later was incredible so i i just 
wanted to add that. Thank you. That sounds wonderful, and I'd love to uh, follow your projects a bit more. Yeah, this was um, Kabela Malazzi, who has worked also closely with Rux um, Media Collective uh, on on the Yokohama Triennale, but worked with other colleagues as part of it. Um, and um, yeah, thank you, Kabela. As this, sorry. So Rux are friends of mine. I mean, Monica and Shuddha are friends of mine. And and I enjoy the way that they you know connect their um, their more verbal and sort of you know intellectual well their more verbal sides with their art production. Um, uh, I I wanted to add one part to her question that she mentioned. It's not possible to for liberal other than if you are not a liberal. But I want to restructure it in a way that I am saying it's not possible to be in a position of that kind of power being a lower caste or a Dalit person. So, in a uh, like, for example, our jurisprudence, almost the whole of it was like we, we say that Ambedkar has written the constitution. But historically, Ambedkar was brought in later, not at the beginning. And we simply overlook that because it is advantageous for the upper caste to promote this that Ambedkar was attached at the beginning. Also, something Cabello men mentioned that courtrooms are turning more into forums. But in Indian justice system, we don't really see that. So. In a most of the time, the person who are presenting are not always, uh, they do not always know the law or the repercussion of the system. So, how do we change that and how do we change that via dialogue and art? Mm. So, you know, something that isn't known, widely known, is that. Uh, Baba Sahib and Bedkar actually wrote, worked very hard and wrote quite a lot of the constitution. And he, it's for various reasons, like, you know, somebody was sent off to the United States because they had to be, you know, deployed there. And somebody was sick, you know, it's the kind of thing that happens in many of our workplaces. And it was he who did most of it. And at one point, um, you know, he was being congratulated and he just said that he said, I just did what I was asked. It was a hack job, uh, which was kind of interesting because, of course, it wasn't a hack job. It was a great job, right? Um, so while there was a constituent assembly and while there were other people and, you know, all of that. Um, and, of course, he had a lot of struggles, including with the Hindu court bill, you know, where, which he rejected and said, I refuse to have anything to do with it. And he, there was a huge sense of disillusionment and disappointment he had over that. Um, I don't think that's, that's a space that was uh, challenging in the way that, uh, that you apprehended. Um, you know, getting better lawyering, I mean, I think that's important because people's rights are being represented, right? One thing that that I think is going to be quite good is video conferences because it opens a Supreme Court litigation to somebody from Bulan Shaher or you know Tutti Kodi, somebody who's you know somebody from a or even somebody from a smaller place who just happens to have a phone, right? Because otherwise, the uh, otherwise Supreme Court litigation is very much dominated by us uh, lawyers from Delhi, you know, and it's a it's the bar is a elite and small one. Uh, it opens up. It'll open up litigation to you know even lawyers who have uh, small children. Like I think we're going to be representing. Um, two lawyers, a father and, uh, you know, the, the person who's sitting next to the last question, I think she's been wanting to ask for a while. See, I can see her from here. Natasha? <laughs> Hi. 
Let's do one last question from her because she really has been wanting to ask for a long time. Thank you. Uh, I would say I really love your conversation and the direction it took from the beginning. There is one question and it's more of an open question but I do want to ask it to you personally because as an artist and as, a, as an artist who is beginning their career at this point of time here in India in this climate, not just climate, climate, but also political and social climate. For someone who is working, advocating for people's rights in the court and actually achieving impact on ground, what role do you think artists have in this time and space? What kind of impact they can potentially make to further the notion of justice? Thank you. I'm so happy you asked that question. Um, the role of art and rights meets at the point where we both seek to elevate human experience. I mean, no, not elevate human experience, but help realize, help people realize their own humanity and explore their own humanity, you know, come into our beings a little bit or a lot more um, through work that is challenging and inspiring and um, a mirror or um, just something that makes you stop and reflect a little bit. And I think in a time of proto-fascism, art has an even more ro important role than it does in, in other times. Because bringing art to communities that are underserved, making art with communities that are underserved, or bringing those artists to the center. Um, you know, we were talking about that, Natasha and Gauri, just sort of was talking about recently about he, how she is taking her art back to the communities that she creates it with. Uh, uh, our common friend Gauri Gill, she makes work, she's been making work in um, Rajasthan for many years and she takes it back on a regular basis. She makes work with Rajesh Ji who is uh, Adivasi and they take work back and the way it plays out is interesting and different in depending on what it is and where it is. So it's an exciting time to be a lawyer and it's an exciting time to be an artist. And you can be endlessly subversive without breaking, uh, without breaking laws. And um, with regard to that, that's a whole other universe. So maybe another time. Thank you so much for having me. This was a delight. Thank you. Um, also recognizing um recognizing those who 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 are unfortunately at the um, at the in the in the grasp of 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 the law our artists comedians poets uh, Ambedkarite activists who are unfortunately um, not past the grip of law who are in prison despite being unwell despite losing family despite this pandemic uh, just acknowledging those those individuals um, and our, our common failures and hope in, in, in tackling um, and, and being, yes. uh, bringing justice. Uh, I'd yes. like to acknowledge uh, the, the, the term that um, Denise Ferrer de Silva uh, brought uh, into, into my uh, understanding as knowing at the limits of justice. And I'd, I'd like to hold that phrase up for those who are currently incarcerated. Uh, for yeah. hearings beyond the timeline of assigned trials because forensis holds within it the idea of the forum, as A.L. Weissman has noted. The fact that permissible evidence is a narrow subset of evidence that is produced materially, poetically, politically in the world at every moment. And perhaps the larger release of bodies of evidence and rivers of testimony includes justice making as place making 
And so I just wanted to continue on that note um, as we inhabit this present full of asymmetries. Um, but yeah, on the note of hope as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Asha. Thank you, Experiment to have them. Thank you all. Bye. Have a lovely evening. All right. Um, we are ending today, and we are going to go to the gallery, uh, to Baliganj Place. And um, there's going to be a, a walkthrough of Bani Abdi's exhibition, the song, and um, also a performance. And maybe Priyanka wants to say a few words about that.